35. Now, we, we've been working through the Psalms. You guys know I always have these lofty goals of how many we might potentially get through in the summer, and I never attain anything close to that particular goal. But I have them because goals are a good thing. They're a healthy, a healthy thing to have. And I also am aware of my own weaknesses, so I realize I don't reach many of my goals. But I have them. But I was pretty sure that we'd at least make it to Psalm 35 this summer. And um, knowing that, uh, I also realized that when we got to that psalm, I was going to need to be I'm very careful about how I address that. Because this particular psalm is what they call an imprecatory psalm, which I, I might be butchering that pronunciation, but that's a psalm that calls down judgment. Okay? And as you read through the Psalms of David, uh, you see all these, these psalms of praise and these psalms that are, are crying out for mercy. And then you will see some psalms that, that just seem to be calling down judgment on his enemies. And uh, as we get through this, um, it's it's kind of a uh, uncomfortable read a lot of times, especially for us as Christians, because we know what the Bible teaches about us about how we're supposed to treat our enemies, right? That we're supposed to, to love those who persecute us, right? That we're supposed to pray for those who seek to do us harm. And so we come to a song like this, and it can seem a little difficult to get through, a little difficult to digest. And people have been struggling with these for a long time, and some of the results of that has been really positive, um, and some of it has been, been the opposite. Okay? Because sometimes people will come to these psalms and say, you know what, since this is so uh, different from what we kind of expected, um, this is probably just the result of David's sinful nature, and it's not really the inspired word of God. And we have to be really careful about that. that that's not only dangerous, it's also heretical, because this is... God's inspired word. And if we just say that because this is uncomfortable, uh, we're going to call that uninspired. Well, the result of that is a very slippery slope that's going to eventually result in just having a Bible of your own creation, right? And, and so we don't want to do that. So I want to give you just two kind of quick observations about maybe how to look at the imprecatory Psalms um, to, to help us as we digest that. And then we'll look into the specifics of this particular Psalm. Uh, the first thing to remember is that this is God's inspired word. God inspired David to write this not only as a song, not only as a prayer, but as scripture, right? And as a, as that, um, God knew that this judgment was actually going to come, okay? And so we have to understand this. David is not asking for God to give him the strength to go out and like have superhuman strength to like do judgment for himself, like enact revenge on his behalf. What he prays for is for God to judge. He's actually praying for God to do exactly what God will do, right? Which is judge the wicked. Those who refuse to come to him, those who continue in their sin, they will be punished. And so when we look at these imprecatory psalms, what we see is the result of what sin does in our lives. Okay, so we have to see that first and foremost, that this is pointing to something that will happen for those who refuse to come to Christ, right? The second thing I don't want us to miss is that when you read these songs, you will see they're incredibly raw, okay? It's David literally pouring out his, his heart. And this one, I was talking to somebody after uh, after the morning service, they said, this is like the mild one though, right? And it is, this is this is the mild one. Like if you go further, it gets a lot more intense, okay? And some of them are, are very vivid in the kind of judgment that David cries out for. And what we see though, is the fact that God allowed this to be in scripture, okay? That he inspired this to be put into the scripture as we read them, as we study the Psalms does not mean that we should be specifically praying these kinds of words, right? That we should be praying for judgment to come down on our enemies. But it does have some insight into how we should be praying, which is with complete honesty, right? Um, when David was coming before God, he laid out everything about what he was feeling, right? He laid out what it was that he was going through, and it didn't matter if it might have sounded a little rough, okay? And I think sometimes we don't do that. Okay? When we pray, uh, sometimes we're hesitant to maybe sound like, we're not saying the right kind of stuff or sound bad maybe in our theology when we pray and so we hesitate to even pray at all but i can tell you this there is no better place to be corrected in your prayer life than at the feet of jesus okay come to him with your heart pour it out he knows what's in your heart anyway he wants you to lay it before him don't worry about sounding elegant or not because does david always sound elegant no. he doesn't okay and he was a man that was after god's own heart and so we see what david did is he just laid it out we should do the same thing okay so those are kind of like three points um, and now I'll get into the actual points, but don't worry, I'm going to try and like be condensed as I move through this because of that, okay? Uh, so here's our gist statement, which is very long, and these are also your points and your takeaways. So this is like the entire sermon, um, just in condensed form. So literally, like I always say, like if you drift off after this point, you will know what you missed, okay? This is what it would have been, okay? <clears throat> so we need to remember, your hope rests in his salvation, nothing else. His salvation, his salvation alone. 
In contrast, though, what we're going to see in this, this judgment psalm is that the ultimate condemnation of the lost is incredibly serious. So we should keep our hearts in the right place, even if it seems like everybody else and everything else in the world is bent on destruction. We trust his ultimate vindication, and we strive to be people who spread his praise. Okay, that's what we see in this song. So let's pray, and then we'll dive in. Father, thank you so much. Thank you that we have a chance to study your word. Thank you that, that you've given us this place to do that. And Lord, I just pray that as we open up uh, a piece of scripture that... Uh, sometimes it's, it's hard for people to walk through. And I know that, Lord, as I've studied it this week, this has been um, a blessing uh, as I've struggled through it, Lord, uh, to come to see what, what you're saying. And I just pray that, that I wouldn't detract in any way, that I wouldn't mislead in any way, but that we would just dive wholeheartedly into what your word is saying and what we'd be impacted by that. Father, I pray that we would have the motivation to pray like this. That we would lay out our concerns, lay out our burdens, lay uh, out the things that we are carrying with us. Leave them at your feet. Father, you know what everybody brought into this place, and I don't. But I thank you, Lord, that your word is faithful and true. So I pray that you would use it to speak to those needs. To strengthen us, to encourage us, to convict us, to turn us closer. It's in Jesus' most wonderful and precious name we Amen. All right, so the first thing that we see, and we're going to look at the first three verses for this, is that we need to remember that our hope rests in his salvation and his salvation alone. This is actually a really common theme uh, in the Psalms. It's actually something that we've talked about several times already this summer. But it's something that if we could really get our minds wrapped around that and really let that change our lives, it would impact everything and literally change everything about the way that we live. So look at, look at how he develops this in the first, first three verses here. It says, a Psalm of David, contend... O oh Lord, with those who contend with me, fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler and rise for my help. Draw the spear and javelin against my pursuers. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. I love this because literally what he's doing is he's calling for God to stand in his place and fight the battle for him. Okay? He's not saying, God, give me the strength to wield the shield and the buckler and to wield the spear and the javelin. He says, I need you to take the shield. I need you to take the javelin. I need you to stand in my place. And that's something that we can and should pray with confidence, right? That God will be the one that stands in our place and fights for us. And this picture is beautiful. It's like he's going to be his defense. Okay? He says, take up the shield and the buckler. These are things that warriors would have used to, to stop the attacks from coming. Or they're just defensive mechanisms. But then he also says, pick up the spear and the javelin. And I can't help but, but notice that those are very specific weapons, right? He doesn't say, take up the dagger and the sword. Okay, he says, the spear and the javelin, which are both things that you fight with from a distance, okay, right? Uh, and so he is literally saying here, stand in my place and keep my enemy away from me. And I think even if you're not a Christian, this is something you can get behind, right? The idea of someone standing in your place, fighting your battles for you, being the one that protects you, keeping the, the, the enemies at bay, that's something that even if you don't believe in Jesus, you, you would want somebody to do this, right? But the only reason that we can have that kind of confidence and pray those kinds of prayers is because verse 3 is true. And I love verse 3 because he's, he's saying in the midst of this battle, right, in the midst of this conflict, in the midst of this hardship, I need you to do this. Say to my soul, O Lord, I am your salvation. I love that. I absolutely love that because that's why we can have this hope. We can say, God, stand in my place, fight my battle because he has. Okay. Jesus has already fought the ultimate battle for us. He stood in our place. He took on hell in our place. The hell we deserved, he took upon himself so that we could have a place to stand. Right. He defeated our ultimate enemy already. And if we come to him and we give him control of our lives, he continues to stay in our place fighting those battles every single day and when we stand before the father on judgment day who's going to stand in our place then jesus right and so we can say god stand in my place because that's what he has done right he is our salvation i love that say to my soul i am your salvation that's that's our hope our hope comes from knowing that he is the one who has saved us right and so that's where this whole psalm begins right and then we get into the part that i guess gets into the bit of the controversy right uh, in verses 4 through 8, we see kind of the condemnation, but it's the flip side, okay? So we know that our hope comes from being saved. But in contrast, those who have not yet experienced that hope are in a very serious and dangerous situation, right? And so look at, look at how he paints this picture, right? Because uh, really what he's doing is he's showing us what the situation of the lost 
already is, okay? <clears throat> it says, let them say, or let them be put to shame and dishonor who seek after my life. Let them be turned back and disappointed who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. Let their way be dark and slippery without, with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause, they hid their net from me. Without cause, they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come on upon them when, it does, when he does not know it. And let the net he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his destruction. So this is where it gets a little rough, right? He's, he's praying for these things, but he's praying exactly what's going to happen for those who do not repent. Okay, what is the condition of everyone who does not turn from their sin? They're going to continue in this situation, right? They will face shame and dishonor and disappointment, right? Like chaff, they will be blown away. Okay? Their lives are not going to end pleasantly, okay? Um, they don't have that hope of knowing Jesus as their Savior. Instead, they are trying to do it on their own. And when you try to do it on your own and you try and look for yourself, what does it lead to? This, right? That you are running down this dark and slippery path away from, do you guys notice who they're running from? The angel of the Lord, right? And why is the angel of the Lord chasing after them? Really, for salvation, right? For salvation. Now, they, they know that there's judgment coming, right? If they don't turn to the angel, they are going to face judgment. But we know that surely goodness and mercy will chase after you all the days of your life, right? We have this goodness that is coming, but they don't want it, right? And so they run down this dark and slippery path that will ultimately just lead to destruction. Okay, that's what David is saying here. Like, this is what's going to happen. Okay, this is, this is the, that inspiration of the prayer. Like, he's saying, Lord, punish those who are wicked, those who are living apart from you, because I know that's what's going to happen. Okay, but does it have to happen? No, and that's, that's where he goes next, right? And so we, we see this, that this is the actual situation of the loss, and what it reminds us then is that sin is incredibly, incredibly serious, right? And I think we know that, like, we're, you guys are all in a church building today, so none of you are going to come in here and say, well, sin's not that big of a deal, okay? Like, you came here, you probably already accept that truth. But sometimes we say it in our head, but we don't really live like that, right? We don't really live like we're taking sin that seriously. We kind of talked about that a little bit last week as well. Um, we kind of live in a culture that has, like, a shame, shame of kind of approach to sin. Like, we know that it's bad, we're probably not going to do that ourselves, we might try to avoid those kinds of actions, but we don't really always take it that seriously. And when we see sin in other people's lives, uh, sometimes we might say, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing that, but we don't look at it through the lens of Scripture, which, if you live completely enslaved by sin, what will it lead to? Death, hell, right? It's going to lead to hell, it's going to lead to your own destruction, but we don't look at it that way, right? In fact, sometimes, even if we don't completely embrace the sins that, that our world embraces right now, and of course, like the hot topics in our society now usually have something to do with like sexuality and gender and abortion and things like that, and we might not fully embrace those, but sometimes we do encourage them, right? By jumping on the same trends and bandwagons that everybody else is doing, but we have to remember sin and living a sinful lifestyle is more serious than personal choice, okay? Uh, when we say that sin is something that will destroy you, that's not just because it goes against the lifestyle that's more comfortable for me, okay? Uh, what we're saying is there is a God who loves you and designed you and has a purpose for you, and this is how you were made to live, and this is where you're going to find fulfillment, and this is how your life was designed to be. And I just turned that off, but I turned it back on. We're good. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> but if you don't follow after him, all you're doing is leading to your own destruction, right? We, we ignore that. We don't take sin as seriously as we should. So if you find yourself today in a position where you've never given your life to Jesus, that you have know that you are living your life for yourself, what you need more than anything else is to come to him, right? You need his salvation. So that you can say, Lord, say to my soul, you are my salvation, right? You need to be in that spot. But if you are in that spot, then you should live your entire life wanting to tell other people about that. Because if they don't know, you're just leaving them in a position where they are running down that dark and slippery slope to their own destruction. Okay, that's the picture that we see so far. So if this is true, then in the midst of all this, we need to keep our hearts in the right place. Keep our hearts in the right place. Even if everything and everybody else seems bent on that destruction, we shouldn't be. And I love this because sometimes people read these, these imprecatory psalms. They focus in on the condemnation part and they miss all of the grace. Okay, And there's definitely grace and there's definitely life transformation in here. And it's beautiful. Look at verses, um, we'll go 9 through, I think, 18 through all stop here. 
says, then my soul will rejoice in the Lord, exulting in his salvation. Notice he's exulting in the salvation of the Lord, not in the judgment of his enemies. All my bones shall say, O Lord, who is like you? Delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him, the poor and needy from him who robs him. Malicious witnesses rise up and they ask me things that I do not know. They repay me evil for good. My soul is bereft. But when they were sick, I wore sackcloth and afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed with head bowed on my chest. I went about as though I grieved for my friend or my brother. As one who laments his mother, I bowed down in mourning. But at my stumbling, they rejoiced and they gathered. They gathered together against me. Wretches whom I did not know tore at me without ceasing like profane mockers at a feast. They gnashed their teeth at me. How long, Lord, will you look on? Rescue me from their destruction, my precious life from the lions. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. So there's a couple things I want to see, and I guess I didn't turn that. You want to read super fast, that's what I just read to you. Um, that, that we could look at so much from this little passage, but there's just two things I want to say this morning. The first thing is, notice that he mourned over the calamity of the wicked. You guys notice that? Uh, so he's, he's saying, Lord, I praise you for my salvation. I thank you for what you've done. Uh, even though they, they, they came and they rejoiced when I stumbled, right? They gathered together when I was struggling. But when they were sick, since I mourned, and the language that he uses there is incredibly strong. You notice what he said? He says, I grieved as for my friend or my brother or as one who laments his mother. I bowed down in mourning. That's, that's incredible love. Okay, I've, I've not lost my mom, but I know some of you guys have. And when you go through that, how hard of a situation is that? It's terrible, terrible, right? If you lost a close friend or you lost your brother or your sister or a close family member, that's incredibly difficult. And he says, I mourned for them like I was losing someone I love. And this should seem a little jarring, okay? Because he just called for their condemnation. Did you guys get, get this? He just called for their judgment. He said, but you know what? I don't want to see them suffer. Right? I don't want to see them in despair because I love them, even though they don't love me. Where did this come from? Jesus. Right? Because isn't that exactly the same thing he did on the cross for us? Right? We were his enemies. We were the ones who despised and rejected him. We were the ones that had turned our backs from him. And he didn't wait till we had it all figured out. He didn't wait till we had somehow become nicer or better people. He came and he took on hell in our place, rose again, victorious over our sin, showing us that love was bigger than our sin, right? Love was bigger than our circumstances and that he cared about us that much. And David understood that about the love of his God. And so he cried out, Lord, I, I, I cared about them even when they didn't care about me. And I'm going to praise you, and I'm going to thank you, and I'm going to lift up songs to you, even though at this moment that he thanked God was answering his prayer. Now he said, how long, O oh Lord, will you look on? But I will, I will thank you, and I will praise you, because I know, even though I'm not seeing it right now, even though it doesn't seem like that's happening right now, I know you're working, and I know you are still good. Right? So we keep our hearts in the right place, even if it seems like everything else around us is bent on destruction, right? And so then we'll look at this last part. I know there's a lot of a lot of song today, but we'll get through it pretty quickly here. Um, then if we know this, okay, we know this is who we are. We know this is where our hope comes from. We then trust in His vindication. We're going to read the rest of the song. I guess I'll read it from up here so I don't I don't lose you guys. But we'll read 19 to 28. It says, "Let not those who rejoice over me, who are wrongfully my foes, and let not those meet the eye who hate me for that cause, for they do not speak." Peace, but against those who spied in the land, they devise words of deceit. They open wide their mouth against me. They say, aha, aha, which I, I think that part's just funny that we translated it that. I don't know what the Hebrew word was there for aha, aha, but aha, our eyes have seen it. And then, but I love this right, it says, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. That's what they're saying. But look at verse 22. David says, but you have seen, O oh Lord, be not silent. They think they know me, right? They think they know what my life is about, but you really do. Okay? You really know who I am. O Lord, be not far from me. Awake and rouse yourself for my vindication, for my cause, my God, and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God. Why? According to your righteousness. And not because of any characteristic David has, but because of the righteousness of God that is covered. And let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Aha! There it is again, right? 
our heart's desire. Let them not say, we've swallowed him up. Let them be put to shame and disappointed altogether who rejoice at my calamity. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who magnify themselves against me. Again, we're seeing this picture of what the condition of the lost is going to result in. Let those who delight in my righteousness, though, shout for joy and be glad and say evermore, Great is the Lord, who delights in the welfare of his servant. Then my tongue shall tell of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. Two things here. First, what we see when he's seeking vindication is something that we can relate to, right? We care about our reputations, whether or not we want to admit it. We do, right? And so often as people, we work very hard to have a face put forth where that people see us as we want them to see us, okay? We want them to see us a particular way, so we work really hard at developing that face. But if anything puts a crack in that, okay, and it starts to destroy that, it, it can devastate us. But he's saying, don't, don't carry that burden, right? Who knows you better than anybody else? God, right? And how much does he love you? Yeah. Endlessly, right? Enough to die for you. He says, don't, don't try and vindicate yourself, Okay, your vindication comes from him because of his righteousness. Okay, His righteousness is now covering. He's the one that's going to stand in your place. He's the one that's going to fight your battle for you. So don't try and seek all these other things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and trust him to take care of your details. Right? Because he's the one that holds your future. So what should you be spending your life doing? Praising him. right? Seeking to see him praised by other people. That's what your life should be about. Okay, so... Real quickly, just kind of recap here everything that we looked at. Number one, remember that your hope comes from his salvation. Okay? That you can say in the midst of the storm, in the midst of everything that's tearing you down, oh Lord, remind me, say to my soul, I am your salvation. That's who you are. You are people who have been saved by him. You can come to him. You can enjoy that salvation. You can enjoy that hope. Or you can run down that slippery slope that leads to destruction. Right? That's the contrast, that ultimate condemnation of sin is serious okay it will lead to hell it's not just something that we talk about in church to make people do what we want them to do okay i don't want you to do what i want you to do i just want you to know jesus and be changed by him right and that's what our life should be about so keep your heart in the right place okay even if everything seems like it's leading towards destruction you remember that these people who might be annoying you right now who might be tearing you down right now are people who need to hear the gospel mourn for their situation Pray that God would rescue them. Don't just get mad at them for being sinners, okay? Point them to the one who can save them. That's what our hearts should be about. And pray that they can join you as a praise spreader, okay? Someone who wants to see the name of the Lord lifted up. We want to see that happen. That's what our lives should be about. And that's what I would say I take away from this first imprecatory psalm. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. Thank you that we have a chance to, to read your word. And Lord, I thank you, but it, it's always so powerful and always so true. So I just ask, Lord Jesus, that as we uh, sing this song of invitation, uh, Lord, that it would be that, that it would be a chance for us to, to lay down all the burdens and the concerns and the struggles that we brought into this place right now. Before we leave, Lord, before we leave and we just kind of jump into like everything else and we start doing the things that we're going to do afterwards and we get some lunch and we... I spend time with our families, or we go do whatever it is that we were going to do. I pray, Father, that we don't lose this chance to stop and, and, and listen to you. Father, if there's someone in this room right now that doesn't know you, I know that more than anything else in this room, that is the most important concern. Father, if they can't say, Lord, when I'm going through stuff, I want you to remind you, remind me that you're my salvation because they've never experienced your salvation. They don't have that hope. Uh, when they hear me say things about you standing in my place and you fighting my battles for me, they, they think that it's silly. Why don't I just fight my own battles? Why don't I just do this on my own? And God, I, I don't want to because I can't. But I, I've ran down that slippery slope. I've ran from your grace, and I know that what it leads to is just despair. So I pray, Father, that you would grab them, that you would pull them up that slope, and that you would rescue them right now, that they would see their great need, and that they would come to you to be saved. Father, I know that you can. So I ask that before they would even leave, Lord, that they grab somebody so that we can rejoice in what you've done. And Father, if there's someone in here that they know you, um, but Lord, they're not, they're not living like that. They're not, they're, they've allowed the despair and the frustration 
uh, to make it to where all they really want to do is call down judgment. <laughs> all they really want to do is for me to preach this sermon again and say, what you guys should be doing is go home and you just complain about everything that's bad and you're justified in that. Um, but Lord, if that's where our hearts are, I pray that we remember that our vindication doesn't come from ourselves. It doesn't come from society changing in a way that we want it to change. It comes from you and knowing you and being yours. And so I pray, Father, that they would have that hope renewed and that they would go out wanting to see your name praised and having that on their lips as they do this for us. Father, speak to us again as we, we sing this final song in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.